Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today, we'll be exploring the hermetic tradition and the mythical founder of that tradition, Hermes Trismegistus. With me is Gary Lockman. Gary is a historian of esoteric traditions. He has written over 20 books describing politics in the occult, the role of the imagination, and the lives of many great esoteric teachers, including Rudolf Steiner, Madame Blavatsky, Aleister Crowley, P.D. Uspensky, and Hermes Trismegistus. Once again, this is an internet interview, and so now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Gary. It's a pleasure to be with you. Oh, thank you for having me on again, Jeffrey. And we're going to be talking about the Hermetic tradition, Hermes Trismegistus, the mysterious founder of an even more mysterious tradition. But I guess one thing can be said uh, for sure is is that the tradition harkens back to ancient Egypt. Well, yes. I mean, uh, one of the other names that uh, this figure, uh, thrice great as Hermes, Hermes Trismegistus, uh, was uh, known as was the Egyptian. Um, so that was a sort of um, kind of another phrase for him. If you were talking about him or there, um, some sort of reference to him would come up. And um, yes, this is the idea that there was in the dim, dim um, earliest times of mankind, this um, remarkable sage and philosopher and wizard and magician uh, named Hermes. I mean, there are quite a few different Hermes at different times, but um, just the basic idea was that, uh, and he um, received this divine revelation um, and the sort of wisdom that he passed on to his students and his students have passed on, uh, and so on, uh, down the line. And up until the early modern uh, period, the early 1600s, um, he was believed to have been an actual figure and that he had influenced philosophers like Plato uh, and even Christianity, uh, even Moses. Uh, and Jesus, uh, and this gives you some idea of the prestige that he had. But subsequently, um, he lost that, uh, and we know him as sort of, uh, he's kind of the messenger, so he's sort of an image of a messenger, or uh, FTD florists. He delivers flowers uh, around the world now. Um, so, the, Or you can, might see his figures over banks sometime. Um, he was the god of thieves, and, but also the god of uh, money and uh, sort of merchants and crossroads and things of that sort. So you get a fusion of a uh, Greek deity and and sometimes the Egyptian deity Thoth. Well, yes, this is uh, the real origin of um, Hermes Trismegistus, or at least this is what the scholars believe, is that during um, <clears throat> the Alexandrian period, in the early uh, first couple centuries of the Christian era, uh, there was this wonderful um, blending of uh, the indigenous. Egyptian uh, religions, and also uh, those coming from Greece. And you also at the same time had early Christianity and uh, still a strong Jewish presence and, and others as well. So it was a remarkable melting pot of different um, philosophies and beliefs and religions. And one of the things that did happen there is that um, you would often have this blending together of different gods, this this sort of synthesizing of gods that were very similar. And one of the ones that this happened with uh, was Hermes Trismegistus. It wasn't quite exactly a god, but he's the product of the fusion of two, uh, two other gods. There's the Hermes, the Greek god we talked a little bit about just now, and then the Egyptian god Thoth, um, who's the god of writing, and he's this ibis-headed um, god who has uh, a, a sort of pen and a kind of stele in front of him, and he's recording things. And he also invented writing, and he's a messenger. And like uh, the Greek Her Hermes, he's a psychopomp. Uh, he leads the souls down into the underworld. Uh, he also takes them back up uh, in, in, uh, into life again, and, and so on. And um, he uh, has um, 
sort of knowledge of magic and science and the arts, and he's the one who brings civilization to uh, mankind and so on. And um, it just seemed very convenient and very natural for these two gods to sort of come together. And the product was this character, uh, this figure of, of Hermes Tris Magistos. And we don't know who exactly uh, the Hermetists were, because um, they... They were pseudonyms. They, they didn't leave any records of their names, unlike the Gnostics, who were their contemporaries. We know some of the Gnostics because they signed their names, some of their writings. But the, the Hermetists, who wrote uh, the texts that later became known as the Corpus Hermeticum, they just used uh, either Hermes or, or uh, uh, other tat uh, uh, Asclepius and other names uh, that were pseudonyms, names of, of, of the gods and the characters that are in the stories themselves. So we don't really know who these people were, but we did know that they were around at this time. Well, if uh, this is a bit of a tangent, uh, Gary. I don't think you covered it in your book, but if if I were to try to uh, come up with an actual historical Egyptian figure who might fit the mold of uh, Hermes, Trismegistus, it would be the architect Imhotep who designed the the very first large pyramid, the Step Pyramid in Egypt, and also having visited it, I know there's a large building adjacent to the Step Pyramid and quite ancient, uh, which appears to have been the center of a mystery school of, of some sort uh, itself. Uh, are, are you aware of any speculations in, in that area? Also, Imhotep was eventually deified by the Egyptians. Well, I have to say I haven't heard anything uh, about that, but that sounds fascinating. I mean, I always thought something would be found underneath the feet of the Sphinx, uh, that there would be some kind of secret chamber found there where some kind of um, information you know, could be had. But no, uh, this is the first I've heard about that. But he sounds like a likely uh, candidate. Um, uh, I don't know. I mean, I guess you can follow up on that. Let me know. <laughs> well, I, there are other indications, of course, that link the Hermetic tradition to Egypt. For example, uh, the word alchemy, I understand, which is very important in the Hermetic tradition, uh, is derived from the ancient name of Egypt, Cam. Was well, supposed to be out of Egypt, Al-Kem. Um, and yes, this is um, uh, one of the sort of ideas of, of the origin of the term. But strangely enough, um, alchemy, which we know as sort of the hermetic art, and if uh, people know any alchemical text it's the, or hermetic text, it's the very short uh, emerald uh, tablet of Hermes Trismegistos, uh, which was this very short, um, you know, uh, compact um, message as, which gives us the, the fundamental idea of hermeticism, as above, so below, this connection between uh, we ourselves and, and the universe uh, above us is the universe within. Um, but this doesn't get mentioned in these texts uh, known as the Corpus Hermeticum. Um, the first uh, sort of surfacing of the Emerald Tablet uh, is in a uh, Arabic uh, translation, uh, which I think from an original Syrian, if I'm getting the story correctly. But this was much later um, than, the, say, the period when the Corpus Hermeticum was being being written. And which isn't to say that there weren't alchemists in Alexandria at the same time. There were, there were uh, or people that were known. There was Zosimos of uh, Panoplos, who was, um, uh, <clears throat> he, he was aware of the Hermetic uh, uh, teachings uh, because he, he quotes them in um, some of his own work. Um, but um, the Corpus Hermeticum doesn't really talk about alchemy so much as it talks about something that, um, well, I call it in the book, as they call it themselves, cosmic consciousness, which is this kind of... Um, mystical experience of, of the, the total unity of all, of all things. And one of the sort of central um, kind of uh, adages or maxims that's repeated is the one and the all, the one and the all. So there's the connection between the many and the one as well, which we can find in a variety of different uh, spiritual and philosophical traditions too. So um, it's more about <clears throat> getting into this ecstatic state in which one experiences gnosis which was this um, deep, intuitive, immediate kind of knowing of reality. And this is something that the Gnostics, who were contemporaries of the Hermitists, uh, pursued as well. It's interesting that the Gnostics are so similar in many ways and contemporary with the Hermeticists. Uh, do you say Hermetists or Hermeticists, incidentally? The original kind of um, people who composed 
the Corpus Hermeticum. Um, I think they're referred to as Hermetists. And I think those of us who come later uh, or sort of the hermeticists in a certain way, but I mean, it's I'm, I mean, I, I slip in and out myself. So please believe me, I'm not I'm not going to hold anyone down to any kind of scholarly uh, precision here. Well, how would you distinguish the Gnostics from the hermeticists? Well, I think a fundamental difference between the Gnostics and 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 the hermetists, or the uh, at that time, was that well, both of them pursued this ecstatic state of uh, altered consciousness, expanded consciousness, uh, called gnosis, or cosmic consciousness. Um, we can say that the Gnostics pursued it in order to escape from uh, the world, the, the physical world that, that we live in, and um, which they believe was created by this kind of um, idiot demiurge uh, that was originally sort of hired by the true God to create a world and then got carried away and believed that it became the God. And then um, is, is kind of this intermediary who's taken over um, uh, the, a position that it shouldn't occupy um, between us and, and the real God. And whereas there's a similar sort of situation in terms of the creation of, of things in, in the Hermetic story, where likewise there is a demiurge uh, that um, the, the, the one uh, um, <clears throat> news hires more or less to create um, the world, um, what happens is that um, Noose creates man as well in order to share this um, creation with, and man becomes so enamored of the world that he sort of sinks into it, falls in love with it, and, and the world nature kind of embraces. So it's a kind of um, you know, divine kind of uh, plunge into, into reality. And where the Gnostics want to escape, the Hermeticists don't, don't so much want to escape as to sort of transform um, th their relationship to the world, to free themselves of this kind of sunkenness into matter, into immediate reality, but not into, so far to get into another place, but to, uh, to sort of reawaken their, their true relationship with it, as it were. So uh, to not be sort of completely identified or completely hypnotized by the world. And so there's a similar sense of wanting to extract oneself from a kind of um, embeddedness into things, an unreflected reality. But uh, this is why the Gnostics have a certain kind of um, thriller kind of character to them. This is why they were associated uh, with the existentialists uh, in the 50s and the 60s. There's a wonderful book by Hans Jonas just called The Gnostic Religion, I think, where he, he compares Gnosticism with existentialism, where the, sa the, sa the same kind of cosmic anxiety, which you don't find in the Hermetic uh, writings. And they're much more celebratory um, and they're much more sort of life affirming. Mm -hmm. You uh, focus quite a bit in in your book on uh, the quest for Hermes Trismegistus on uh, the influence of the Hermetic tradition and in particular the Corpus Hermeticum on uh, the great uh, thinkers and writers of the uh, Renaissance, both in uh, well, in particular the Italian Renaissance. Oh, precisely. Well, this is how we know of, um, of them. Uh, this is how we know of, of the Corpus Hermeticum and the Hermetic philosophy. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, because it was um, rediscovered uh, during the Renaissance. I mean, we, we know the Renaissance is the time of rediscovering uh, the works of the ancient Greek uh, thinkers and philosophers such as, as Plato, which is true. But um, as Francis Yates and other historians um, pointed out, is that at the same time, uh, there was a rediscovery of this Hermetic philosophy. And um, in 1453, uh, Constantinople fell to the Turks, finally, after uh, years of, of uh, resisting. And this caused a lot of uh, Greek scholars and Christian scholars and churchmen uh, to flee. And in order to sort of fuel their journey, they sold off their libraries. And Cosimo de' Medici, of Florence, he was a great uh, book lover, and he had one of his book scouts, or he had many of his book scouts out there looking for things. And um, uh, one particular batch, he had brought back a lot of Plato, and he wanted to read Plato. So he asked uh, Massilio Ficino, whom he had installed in his newly recreated Platonic Academy, uh, um, uh, as the Greek scholar who was translating uh, Plato for him, uh, said, you know, hurry up and get to work on, on this stuff. And then soon after, another batch of, of books came in, and this was... Um, an edition of the Corpus Hermeticum. And uh, uh, Cosimo basically said to Marsilio, you know, put that on the back burner now, you know, hold, stop the presses, and I want you to translate this first. 
So that's like the story that's told all the time that Plato took a back seat uh, to Hermes Trismegistus uh, because he was supposed to be the source of the knowledge that Plato was was carrying on, was passing on himself. And uh, it was through those translations that uh, a great deal of Hermetic philosophy informed uh, the Renaissance. One of the examples that Francis Yates points out is Botticelli's uh, uh, Venus, Primavera, and which is full of uh, Venusian and a variety of other uh, sort of astrological and, and Hermetic uh, kind of influences, if you know how to read the signs. And even Michelangelo and, and the whole Renaissance notion of man, the rediscovery of man, um, this humanism, uh, originally had much to do with a kind of superhumanism, as I call it in the book, uh, having to do much more with this hermetic uh, kind of rediscovery of, of man's position as, as a microcosm. And you see this in Pico della uh, uh, Mirandola's um, oration on the dignity of man, which um, <clears throat> paints a completely different picture than you know, the wretched sinner of, of the Middle Ages. So it was a real transformation. Uh, and it's something I say in the book marks a kind of shift in, in Western consciousness, a, a, a real change. And we're, we're living now, I would say, in, in the last kind of after effects of that, of that shift 400 years ago. The uh, Renaissance scholars would have assumed that Plato took his inspiration from the uh, Hermetic tradition because uh, Plato and Pythagoras and many other ancient Greeks acknowledged uh, in different ways they had been inspired by things they had learned either in Egypt or from Egyptians. Well, that was the whole idea that they all went to school in Egypt. Uh, this was assumed, and I mean, we we think of Egypt as old, but even Egypt was old back then, or or, or rather, we think of the Greeks as old. Uh, but even though Plato was old, Egypt was old back when Plato was 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 new. Put it that way. Yeah. <laughs> so it's very old, and the whole idea that somehow, well, this is this notion of the origin, you know, the source being the pure the pure source of the knowledge, ra- rather than down in the lowlands where the the, the stream gets muddied up, up, up at the, the pure mountain source of, of the clear waters. If you go back to the Egyptian, you go back to Hermes, this is where Plato and Pythagoras and, and so many others. I mean, there was different, there's slightly different sort of, um, <clears throat> sort of uh, names in this golden chain. I mean, the man who was really responsible uh, for the start of it um, in getting onto the Renaissance and getting Cosimo de' Medici interested was a fellow named Gemistus uh, Plethon. Um, who was a, a Greek scholar from Constantinople. And very old age, he traveled uh, to Italy and be part of this uh, Florence and Ferrara council that was an attempt to get the Western and the Eastern churches together in order to stop the Turk, to, for the Western church to come and save Constantinople from the Turk. Uh, and while he was there, uh, he wasn't a churchman, but he was renowned as a wise man and a scholar and all that. And in between kind of different sessions, he gave these lectures on, on what he called the Prisca Theologia, the perennial philosophy, uh, the, the, the original primal revelation. And he starts with Zoroaster, so rather than Hermes, but the Zoroaster and then this, you know, so and so, and the whole idea that there's this golden chain. So this knowledge is passed on and on and on. And and this was, you know, Hermes was part of this uh, as well. Uh, and so t- the idea that Plato had gone to Egypt, well, that's what he learned when he went to Egypt was this perennial philosophy. And again, at this time, <clears throat> um, when these are rediscovered, there was a strong movement in the church to be able to absorb Platonism um, and also to try and absorb, you know, parts of uh, other faiths as well. There was a multi-faith kind of movement, because they all recognized this idea, which is at the heart of the perennial philosophy, that there's you know, a fundamental revelation and the different religions or different kind of um, you know, rays coming out of it. But at the source, they all share something. Um, and they also wanted to keep Plato, because they recognized this was very good stuff. They didn't want to you know, lose this, even though Aristotle was the, the more favored one. So there was a very favorable uh, tolerant sensibility for a while there where um, the whole idea that the Hermetic philosophy in some way was a precursor, uh, a, a kind of prequel of, of, of Christianity because there's very similarities between uh, different major kind of metaphors and themes in both uh, that you can find in there. So um, there was a lot going for it to believe that, yes, this was his ancient wisdom and, and here, here we have, you know, a, a, a real sizable portion of it now uh, translated, you know, in, in, into Latin for us now. 
Mm-hmm. Now, the, the Hermetic tradition is often associated with Western esotericism in general. It's, I think, sometimes used as an umbrella term for the entire Western tradition, which includes, in addition to alchemy, you would have to add in, as you mentioned earlier, astrology uh, and ceremonial magic being important parts of that tradition. No, yeah, this is true. I mean, there's a specific kind of Hermetic strain um, and then there's a general idea that, okay, magic in general, or the occult, you could say the Western Hermetic tradition, you could say the Western esoteric tradition. I guess once you get, you know, a bit more scholarly and technical, you can fine tune these things. But in general, yes, it's, it's considered that. Although, you know, you could say, well, I was going to say Kabbalah would be a different tradition, but not coming out of the Renaissance, because that was one of the products of the Renaissance was this kind of Christian Kabbalah. And that's the sort of Kabbalah that got handed down in the West as the kind of Western, Western form of it, uh, uh, what sort of, um, you know, the sort of thing that the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, say, were doing in the late 19th century. They had a blend of um, Hermetic tradition and uh, Rosicrucian, which is part of the Hermetic as well, and, and Kabbalistic. But Kabbalistic coming from this Christian Kabbalah that comes out of people like Pico uh, and, and, and others at that time. And also, I suppose the uh, tarot is an important part of uh, Western esotericism and uh, is integrated into what we think of today as the Hermetic tradition. See, this is one of the things. If you're a purist, you can say that, you know, well, Kabbalah has nothing to do with, with you know, this Hermetic kind of thing. It's a completely different. This is something like Gershom Sholem, the great Jewish uh, mystical scholar of the 20th century, but was starting to say, and he takes, you know, uh, lots of stabs at uh, different, you know, writers on Hermetic tradition to shows that they don't know what they're talking about. Um, and um, uh, the um, other, you know, but, but and, and Tarot, too. I mean, Tarot, well, Elif is leaving the 19th century, one of the great um, romantic kind of uh, occult thinkers, wedded the tarot and the Kabbalah in a way that it worked, although it doesn't really, because historically there isn't any real connection, but because of the 22 trumps in the tarot and the 22 letters in the uh, Hebrew alphabet that are related to the 22 paths on the tree of life, um, he somehow, oh yes, so he transposed those, and it's a remarkable feat of uh, 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 imagination, but historically it doesn't quite work. But in another sense, it works because I, I would say the real sense of hermeticism and magic is that it doesn't matter what the source is, it's purity, is that can you put it together in a way that it works, in some kind of creative, imaginative way, and I think that's um, on a wider um, kind of way of looking at it, the, and at the, at the end of the book I sort of talk about sort of the, the hermetic spirit, or the sort of hermetic way of looking at things, which is the synthesizing. It is this kind of bringing together different things and trying to sort of, you know, uh, I, I mean, and, and not, not at random, but seeing, seeing connections at work. So uh, Eliphas Levy's masterstroke there was, a, a, you know, a wonderful mistake, but it's, it's a fantastically fruitful one. Mm -hmm. it, when I think of the Hermetic tradition and its influence on Western culture, what comes to mind for me immediately is Shakespeare's great play, The Tempest, in which he has a, a magus uh, who is shown to be uh, authentic and powerful uh, and very humane at the same time. Uh, Shakespeare's plays are, are a happy hunting ground um, for people in, looking for sort of hermetic references and symbols and metaphors. And uh, yeah, Francis Yates has written about uh, that as well. There's quite a few books about that. And the whole idea of the globe theater, um, again, this microcosm, macrocosm um, polarity uh, where the theater of the world, the world is all the world's a stage. Uh, and so the globe itself the theater, the original design, was supposedly along uh, certain hermetic kind of sacred geometric sorts of things and, and things of that sort. And um, the other, well, well, there's many, but another um, central sort of Shakespearean phrase is, what a piece of work is man? And if you can find that in um, Pico's oration on the dignity of man. I mean, he actually begins uh, the, uh, the oration with that. Um, and again, you know, we say, God, what a piece of work. That fellow is, we tend to think, you know, he's, it's, it's completely negative. But, I mean, what he's saying is actually, this is a time, uh, however naively from our perspective, they're actually celebrating um, uh, the humanity 
and, 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 and his powers and abilities and, and, and creative strengths and all that. And so, yes, you can find that uh, uh, certainly uh, in, in, in Shakespeare. And again, you can, this is one of the things that um, uh, people like Kathleen Rain and, and, and other scholars, Francis Yates again, and other scholars have done, where they've traced these influences that for a long time, the sort of, what do you want to call them, mainstream or, or uh, more conventional sort of literary critics or historians t- tended to kind of sideline. I mean, uh, W.B. Yeats is another uh, example of this, where his, his pursuit of the hermetic philosophy and, and ceremonial magic and a variety of other things was central to his uh, creativity, but for the longest time it was kind of sidelined and put aside as something that you kind of had to you know, sort of just acknowledge, uh, but, but, but hurry past quickly. Well, there's a great irony there because I, I think most historians today would say we can trace the beginnings of our, what we call our modern Western culture to the Renaissance. And central to Renaissance thinking was Hermeticism. But today, Hermeticism is, you'd have to say, it's very marginal in our culture. No, it's true. I mean, um, in this particular time, um, there was uh, a blending or uh, um, sort of m- more open relationship between these things. I mean, they worked together. Again, there was one point where say, Hermeticism in the church, there, there, there were fellow travelers. Um, but then in a strange combination of, of, of events, the church and, and the rising natural science sort of teamed up to sort of knock Hermeticism out of, out of orbit and put it into this kind of of um, counterculture, this this alternative tradition position, which has been in, uh, but at the same time, yes, the whole that whole idea of this re- re- reawakening of um, uh, man's own creative powers and strengths and self confidence that led to science, you know, um, you know, uh, and man, you could look for yourself, but you didn't have to look. Um, always take the word of 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 the past, even though that was part of the hermetic tradition is like the earliest was, you know, the purest. At the same time, it, it instilled um, its participants with the kind of confidence for them to um, look at their own experience as well. And so, you know, people, you know, people like Francis Bacon, he was as interested in a variety of different hermetic philosophies as he was with experimental science, but that's what, that's what took off. You know, that, 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 was, that, that got the funding, as it were, at the time, because it seemed to be the most kind of practical way um, again, that's a different thing. I mean, with the, the rise of the natural science um, and empiricism, it, it had practical results in a way that the hermetic didn't. But that wasn't what it was trying to do. So yeah. there, there, there were different sorts of things. But this new science, which we're still, well, we're, we're sort of at the, it's t- starting to break up around us for the last 50 years or so, but we're still under the uh, sort of dominance of it. It was fundamentally successful because it was it was practical and it was effective and it could it could get get things done in a way that the earlier one didn't well, Isaac Newton, for example, was deeply into alchemy and believed that his alchemical writings were much more important than his writings in physics and mathematics. No, this is true. I mean, if you want to say that uh, the occult is about what's unseen, which is that what it means. It's, it's occluded, you know, it's, it's obscured by something. Uh, then gravity is an occult power because no one's ever seen uh, gravity. And even at the time, uh, Newton was uh, criticized for that, uh, trying to get people to believe in action at a distance, which again, which is a sort of magical idea, sympathetic magic at some way. You do something here and you can make something happen over there. And um, Newton was basically saying that, and he had to sort of, you know, argue uh, against all of that. And as you say, he also wrote reams and reams about alchemy, um, about um, sort of the history of the church and kind of predictions of the um, Antichrist and the Second Coming and things of that sort, and a variety of other things. And this, again, much like the occult or hermetic interests of sort of literary uh, greats, this fascination of his, or it wasn't even a fascination, it was what he was about, actually. He wrote more about that stuff than he did about gravity. Um, became sort of sidelined with the rise of this new, you know, vision of what the new science should be like. And it wasn't until, I think, the 1920s and the economist John Maynard Keynes, he he bought uh, this collection of Newton's papers and he opened this chest and he found, you know, my God, there's all this stuff about alchemy uh, in here and all this, this strange kind of stuff. So I guess it's probably fair to say that Isaac Newton was not a Newtonian the way we think of Newtonians today. No, it's, it's, well, it's, I mean, he did have this kind of very precise, you know, rigorous, you know, 
uh, well-ordered, uh, you know, mind and uh, and uh, and that kind of you know determinism sort of clockwork was was part of it. Uh, but no, but strangely enough, he was um, interested in, as you said, the Hermetic things, and so people like Blake. Um, who just knew him as this sort of, you know, geometer and, you know, someone who's cutting up living, you know, vital experience into these geometric patterns. He, you know, railed against them. And even Goethe, Goethe, uh, who shared the hermetic interest with Newton, they, they weren't contemporaries, but uh, uh, the great poet, you know, uh, Goethe, he uh, practiced alchemy and um, he uh, studied the hermetic philosophies. But he took an argument with Newton over uh, optics, over the spectrum and, and colors and things of that sort. So they, they weren't aware uh, of this um, because I guess, you know, even by that time, you know, that side of him was probably submerged. Mm -hmm. But then... Um Many of those people from that generation, uh, Newton's contemporaries, Robert Boyle uh, was another one, was deeply involved in alchemy and hermeticism. Well, I mean, it's all there. That that's one of the things too. It's it's something that I mean, you'll see it in more recent histories of science and histories of these kind of uh, people. Um, you'll see how something like the Royal Society uh, here in London uh, arose out of uh, links to the Rosicrucian uh, movement of the early 1600s and how the Rosicrucians themselves uh, were informed by a variety of different hermetic ideas. Um, and uh, so, again, there was this kind of blending of um, interest in the rising new natural science, uh, the spread of knowledge, um, which also meant a religious tolerance so that you could explore the implications of the knowledge that you're getting without kind of fear of, you know, being uh, excommunicated or, or whatever. And also this kind of broader um, sense of a, you know, multi-faith, so they're trying to say. There's, there's uh, insight and, and, and knowledge and wisdom in all the different faiths, and, you know, somehow if, if we share the knowledge, we'll be able to see that. And this was this kind of very utopian vision that the, the Rosicrucians had. And then um, that all kind of sort of uh, disintegrated, uh, but it's it, it spread out in different ways. And one way um, that came uh, to to arrive in England was this sort of deep interest in knowledge, deep interest in, in sharing scientific knowledge. And uh, and I said, as you said, people like Francis Bacon and Boyle uh, and others uh, at this time, uh, they had an underlying interest in all these things. And and you could even see it in in Copernicus and um, the whole heliocentric. Um, system uh, has its roots in many ways with um, the hermetic vision of the sun being central, the sun being central figure in, in, in the hermetic uh, cosmology. So th these things were there, um, and whether they're archetypes, and they, you know, um, w were there, you know, simultaneously, or whether there was a kind of transmission. But I think you can see that um, people were aware, was aware of this uh, material, and it was informing their vision of the world. And I think uh, another very important thread to this story would be the role of the Rosicrucians and, and the Freemasons and creating the kind of climate that led to the development of democracy itself and the, the downfall of many European monarchies. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't blame the downfall of the monarchies on, on Hermes, uh, you know, directly, but uh, no, certainly... Um, through different historical sort of um, uh, emergencies of uh, emergences of, of these ideas, you, you, you do have it. Freemasonic ideas um, are full of a great many hermetic uh, notions, and um, the, the sort of enlightenment virtues that were part of the Masonic uh, uh, vision and, and still are, as far as I know. Um, these sort of informed uh, the spirit of the time, as it were, and that you know that that went on and further informed these the whole movements of, of for revolution and so on. I mean, there were, no, but some directly, I mean, hermetic in the sense that they were um, studying the, the unseen. I mean, these sort of Swedenborgian and, 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 and uh, Mesmer, um, strange combination of, they were known as the Societies of Harmonies uh, around the time of the French Revolution or just before. And they were sort of going into these sort of magnetic trances and, seeking, um, you know, knowledge or wisdom from the spirit world in order how to sort of bring about a kind of 
you know, just as medicine would cure his patients by bringing about a kind of crisis of their magnetic sort of flow. So society itself had to go through some kind of similar crisis. So there was some kind of mesmeric revolution, you know, uh, that was the idea that was supposed to be happening. So you did have some of these things, you know, there. I mean, uh, again, this is another side of it, this hermetic I mean, we all think it's over there somewhere, or maybe you can find it on the X-Files, or, you know, it's in some section of a bookshop, but it's actually, it, it runs throughout all the culture and how we understand things. Um, if, if you're sort of aware of that, of that um, sort of influence, you can find it in, in all different sorts of places. Uh, as I recall, one of Elizabeth, um, not Elizabeth, one of uh, Francis Yates' books on the Hermetic tradition refers to the birth of the Rosicrucian movement and the idea uh, we've talked about in other interviews that there are these hidden masters who are in touch with the perennial philosophy and are uh, in their own way guiding the evolution of the human race. Well, this, like I said, this kind of golden chain of, of, of these teachers, these sages the, who pass on the teaching, I mean, that got absorbed into the general kind of Western esoteric kind of consciousness and, and it turns up in, in different ways. Um, in modern times, I would say, yes, yes, the Rosicrucians were kind of the first hidden masters in the sense that, well, we don't even, uh, although maybe hidden isn't even quite the right word because no one ever saw any of them. So they, whether they ever existed or not in any real sense still remains a kind of, you know, uh, um, uh, talking point as it were. But, um, I mean, the story is that in uh, the early 1600s uh, in Kassel, uh, Germany, these uh, sort of pamphlets appeared announcing the arrival of this brotherhood, uh, the Brotherhood of the Rosy Cross. Um, and um, they were announcing this general reformation of Europe. And it was along the lines of what I was talking earlier, this kind of um, new world of, of religious, religious tolerance and sort of sharing of knowledge and also sort of healing the, healing the sick. This was another uh, part of the, the Rosicrucian thing where people would, uh, the whole idea that they would go and share their medical knowledge. And uh, just as Jesus, you know, he healed. This is one of the things he did. So, uh, And um, Hermes is also sort of the inventor of medicine and all things of that sort. And... Um, over different, you know, over time, other pamphlets appeared, and people started wondering who were these people because they were saying, "Please come and join us if you want to take part in this wonderful transformation that's going to take place uh, soon." Um, and you know, please seek us out. And people tried to find them, and they couldn't be found. No one could, no one could find them, and um, they came to be known as the Invisibles. Um, so they were that hidden that, you know, they were just, they're invisible from, from the beginning. And one of the people who tried to find them was Rene Descartes. Um, and there was a joke about how, uh, when he was meeting some friends at, at the pub or something and they said, oh, there's Rene, he's a Rosicrucian now. And, uh, he said, oh, can you see me? And they said, yes, we can. He said, well, I'm, I'm not invisible, so I can't be a Rosicrucian. So, um, this was, you know, Sort of kind of you know, or, you know sort of thing going around at the time, and um, but the idea is that it was uh, what was known as a ludibrium, uh, and a fellow named Johann Valentine Andre, um, who uh, was a uh, sort of uh, Lutheran pastor uh, from Tubingen. Uh, Tubingen was a famous um, university. Uh, uh, town. It still is in Germany. Um, and he was, he was from a particular gen uh, generation around just before the Thirty Years' War. And, and it was uh, the, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, yeah, and it was the, um, um, there's this thing called the Tubian Circle that he was a part of, a kind of semi secret society. But within this, um, he came up with this idea of kind of what he called the serious joke. And I guess you could call it a hoax, or it would be the kind of thing that would be going on today with anonymous would be doing this sort of thing uh, online and uh, or these kind of flash mob sort of stuff where um, you, you sort of announce something, invite people, and the people who come or are, are become the Rosicrucians themselves. So, you know, the ones who try to find the Rosicrucians, they sort of become the Rosicrucians in a certain way. And this is more or less what happens with this generation um, that uh, there's what I call the Rosicrucian diaspora because you have the, the collapse of uh, this movement with the start of the, the Thirty Years' War and um, the sort of collapse of this Protestant resistance to the Habsburgs and all that. And they get spread out over Europe. Uh, but part of that wave arrives in, in England and sets the roots for this, well, the, the Well College had its roots in this idea of the Invisible College, as you said earlier. So, again, this is this kind of background hermetic influence that's there if you kind of look for it. You, you can see that it's... 
Another key figure in sort of the history of the Hermetic tradition would be uh, John Dee, who, as I recall, was the court astrologer to Queen Elizabeth I in England and uh, actively involved in ceremonial magic and contact with uh, alien intelligences and so on. One of the things Dee was doing was um, what part of the Hermetic tradition was about, was about sort of basically talking with God, you know, sort of, under, you know, having direct kind of contact and communication. And um, where well, he, he didn't go into ecstatic states, and he, and he didn't sort of um, go into sort of trance states on his own, but he did use um, a scryer, uh, this, this fellow, Edward Kelly, who was a bit dubious character. And incidentally, um, Alistair Crowley claimed to have been him in a previous life. And, um, you know, I, I'll, I'll give him that one. Um, but um, um, and um, Kelly would look into the showstone. Um, it wasn't quite a crystal ball, but you can see it if you ever come to London. It's at the British uh, the British Museum, and it was this kind of strange mirror, a kind of black mirror, and that he would look into it, and they would have these visions, and an angel would come, and an angel would sort of point uh, to these strange letters. And um, w- one of the things that Dee did is that he took down. Uh, this uh, alphabet called Enochian. And Enoch in sort of the apocryphal Bible is related to Hermes. So again, this this is the kind of um, syncretic or correspondence in the Hermetic tradition, where it just is like Thoth and Hermes, you know, sort of uh, were related to each other. So then in, this, in the Judeo-Christian Enoch is a kind of a character likened unto Hermes. And Idris in, in the Muslim tradition is a similar character too. Um, and so um, he takes down this Hermetic alphabet, uh, Enochian, and this is um, later on is used by a variety of different people. Crowley's one of them, and uh, Yeats as well. The Hermetic Order, the Golden Dawn, they, they uh, incorporated um, knowing and using the Enochian alphabet as well. And again, D is one of the ones who crosses over into science as well, because he's a mathematician, um, and um, he's also responsible for the idea of the British Empire and, and this whole sort of idea. So there's, uh, and he was involved with certain machinations um, in Eastern Europe uh, leading up to sort of the time prior to um, sort of the Rosicrucian um, uh, um, movement. Uh, so yeah, so he was involved in a variety of different kind of occult kind of politic uh, kind of things going on as well. It it strikes me, Gary, that one theme that seems to run through all of these different episodes of uh, Western Hermeticism is is the idea of cultural fusion, and it, it starts really with the Greek culture and the Egyptian culture fusing during the period of, of the Alexandrian era. It's this idea of being able to see connections between things, which is a central idea within the Hermetic tradition itself, this whole notion of correspondence. I mean, it's the idea that there's, um, uh, you know, r- rather than the causal relationship, which we, we know of things, you know, you know, uh, cause and effect, you pick something up, you put it down, that sort of thing. There's a sort of meaningful relationship or, or a relationship between like or uh, an analogous kind of relationship between things. And one of the um, practices, um, if you're following the hermetic uh, way of, of education, as it were, is to sort of learn a variety of different correspondences that have, you know, been, they've been handed down traditionally. But it's also a way of being able to think and be able to see, um, see things. And it's, it's more of a kind of, uh, I don't know, I mean, I don't want to cut it too finely like this, but you can say it's more of a right brain kind of way of looking at things than sort of a left in a sense. But actually, what it is is really is both of them at the same time. Um, because it's not just a kind of gauzy, cozy kind of sense of oneness with everything, but it's actually an articulate, eloquent way of seeing relationships between things that are not kind of the normal relationships you might, you might see. And, it's, and I mean, something like synchronicities would be a very kind of striking example of it, but there's other ways you can see it. And poetry, there's sort of like a poetic, a metaphoric way of, of, of looking at things. And um, although you do have the exact kind of hermetic practices in the arts, like astrology and magic, they too operate, you know, through this metaphoric correspondent kind of way, as above, so below. I mean, there's a correspondence between um, the events in the heavens and and, and those on earth. And there's also, again, a correspondence between the whole cosmos out there and and the one within yourself. And the hermetic path is becoming aware of that cosmos uh, within yourself, um, uh, I would say. And it's, you know, again, there's a peculiar uh, trajectory in, in, in the ancient path where they, they 
this you kind of retrace uh, your your journey back through the planets. You know, we fall from the higher heavens down, and as we land on Earth, um, we acquire certain um, uh, sort of uh, characteristics from all, each of the planets, and they kind of weigh us down. And uh, you know, I mean, you can see relationships between something like Jungian uh, psychology, where there are kind of active forces in the unconscious, and until you become aware of them, um, they kind of push you around. But then when you become aware of them, it's not so much you get rid of them, as that you, 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 you're aware that they're there, and you, you, know, you can work with them, or you're, you're no longer uh, sort of dominated by them. So it's a similar, similar sort of thing. In uh, several of our previous interviews, Gary, we've talked about great spiritual teachers of the 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries, people like Rudolf Steiner, Emanuel Swedenborg, Helena Blavatsky, even Colin Wilson. And I suppose it's fair to say that they, they've all been influenced in one way or another by the Hermetic tradition. Well, I, I would say yes, because I would say in general... Um, it's it, our, it, it, its origin is is actually within ourselves, it's, as all things are. You know, but I mean, it's it's within our own psyche. And um, in a book I did a few years ago called "The Secret Teachers of the Western World," which is more or less a kind of history of the West through through the lens of this esoteric tradition. Um, one of the things is that um, it's it seems to have its roots in this this other. I, this other part of ourselves, which, you know, for convenience sake, we can speak of as the right brain or the unconscious. Um, but it's something other than our everyday ego, which is more associated with the left brain and its identification with language, you know, as, as, as I'm using now. Um, but um, it's, it's like this counter tradition that's, that's been there from the start. And uh, it sort of got shoved aside with the rise of, of science, and, and necessarily so. Uh, in many ways, in order for you know what we know is science to be able to uh, develop, um, but it, again, it's not something that even though many scientists and many very rationalist thinkers say oh, we've kind of we finally put this to bed, this is like uh, we, we've debunked all of this. It, it just won't go away because it's other part of ourselves, and it's part of ourselves that sees the world in that way, and, and it has a different way of relating to the world, and it isn't this kind of um, uh, sort of way in which we keep the world at a distance in, in order to maneuver ourselves uh, through it and to survive in it. It's the way in which we participate with the world. And I would say this whole hermetic tradition, the whole notion of correspondences and, and the, the idea of a living universe and that, that's also conscious in some way and, and can actually relate and react to our, our, our sort of attempts to communicate with it. Um, which goes back to our earliest notions of a kind of, you know, uh, wonderful world of spirits and, and, and elementals and things of that sort. Um, this is a whole sort of what I would call a kind of participatory uh, way of uh, being in the world. And um, I think that's something that today, in a way, I would say a lot of events taking place in the world today, and I write about it in a book called Dark Star Rising um, about <clears throat> contemporary politics. Um, the kind of darker side of that is coming out because we haven't learned how to assimilate it um, in a more conscious kind of way. And I think that's what we need to do now, but it's, 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 uh, it won't wait. <laughs> you know, we sort of have to hurry up and, 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 and do it more consciously because it strikes me that it's, it's sort of uh, coming out now in uh, ways we can't control. Well, there are paradoxes uh, involved in the Hermetic tradition. For example, these ideas that we've been describing are, are so powerful. They've run through Western culture now for uh, 2,000 years or more. And at the same time, uh, the authorship of the Corpus Hermeticum and uh, uh, is still kind of uh, controversial or, or not what it appears to be. And, and as you mentioned, the, the one book most associated with Hermeticism, the Emerald Tablet, uh, arrived much later than uh, the Corpus Hermeticum itself and isn't really part of uh, that set of documents. Well, I, I, I wouldn't know. I, it's, it's not considered part of the Corpus Hermeticum, although you could say it's part of the larger body of hermetic hermetic writing um because there doesn't seem to be a, a greek original of it or at least as far as i know no greek original has um turned up as i say i i, I think the original was in syrian or something like that and then it was an arab translation and then that um geber um was that was around his time uh, in the ninth century or so, I believe, and then that later got translated in, into Latin and got picked up 
and you know became part of the the alchemical movement in the in the Middle Ages in in the West. Um, and that is much more related to the alchemical kind of processes in in some sort of way, and and not so much the uh, this kind of cosmic consciousness. But there are different sort of forms. I mean. I mean, even within alchemy itself, you, uh, uh, it seems to have been really about trying to make gold, or at least to sort of spread out the gold you already had, you know, to make more of what you had in some way. And then gradually, maybe along the same lines as masonry, uh, this kind of transposition within that too, it turned into a kind of spiritual kind of transformation, where masonry became a kind of spiritual kind of construction of, of, of the human cathedral, uh, as it were. Um, and uh, But um, there's also the kind of, um, well, Paracelsus, who was known as the sort of Hermes of the North um, in sort of the late Renaissance period. And he wasn't so much about making gold, but it was about um, this uh, elixir vitae or, you know, the, the panacea um, healing and knowing the properties of the plants and this kind of... He doesn't really talk about this kind of cosmic consciousness so much, but he does really have this idea where he can see into he can see into the plants and he can see into nature and he can he talks about being able to look through nature as one looks through a glass and this is something that Jakob Burmer you know will say later on and again this kind of where things that seem solid and impenetrable to us in our everyday state can become transparent or translucent in some way and again this is part of this participatory um, kind of consciousness so but this is part of this hermetic tradition too but this is more of a medical uh, kind of one too so there's different and again you know the, the, the Rosicrucian tradition is about healing the healing arts as well uh, so there's different kind of you know variants on, on the alchemical um, kind of motif uh, but um, I, I would say you know in the kind of background uh, noise to the whole Western esoteric tradition is this hermetic idea of the as above, so below, the microcosm, macrocosm. That's kind of the background kind of thing. And within that, you know, these various different ones uh, have their own specific kind of line of development. What do we know about the authors of the original uh, books in the Corpus Hermeticum? Nothing. We don't know anything about them. That's insane. We don't. We, there's no, no names. So we don't know, you know, uh, we know that they knew the Gnostics, or at least the Gnostics knew them, because among the texts found at Nag Hammadi um, were some um, Hermetic uh, texts. Uh, and again, they probably shared similar sorts of procedures, as it were, or, or you know, sort of rituals. And uh, I mean, they both kind of um, used what was known as kind of these barbarous, barbarous words and this kind of these weird nonsense um, you know, if you remember sort of I am the walrus or something like that, but, you know, weirder than that. And they would sort of chant these things, and this would be something that would put them into these ecstatic states. Um, so I think they probably shared, you know, different practices um, and may even, you know, shared communities. I think they were part of these desert communities out, out, outside of Alexandria. But as I say, we don't have any names about them. And oddly enough, you know, someone who you think, had he known of them, would have mentioned them because they're very similar uh, was Plotinus. The Plotinus writes critically of the Gnostics. He doesn't like the Gnostics because he thinks they're too elitist. It's like, oh, there's a, a secret. And once you get the secret, you know, you're, you're in and you have the mystical vision. He said, no, you know, you have to go through the dialectic and he was, you know, Platonist and the thinker and all that. But this notion of the one, which is the, the Neoplatonic uh, target and the same thing with the, the hermetics it, it's, it's the one as well they were both sort of after after the one and after the sense of the one and the all and um i would think that had he known of them he would have written about them um uh, but I, I haven't come across any uh references so there's we don't know any of the names we don't know who they were just like we know you know uh basilides or we know harpocrates or we know some other of the gnostics we can find them historically. We can't find any of these people. So talk about the hidden masters. I mean, there you go. I mean, it's, it's at the very beginning. Well, haven't there been some interesting analyses, though, of the uh, uh, language that they use that that can date them pretty precisely? Oh, oh okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's what I'm saying. We, we know they were from around that time because we, uh, well, this is what happened. This, yeah, yeah, but well, this is what happened. Originally, they were thought to have been written you know, in the dim, dim past, you know, earlier than Plato, earlier than Moses. And, um, and this is why they had this tremendous prestige and were treasured. And, but what happens in the 
again, the early 1600s, um, just around the time, just before the Rosicrucian um, sort of uh, turned up. And they're not related, but thematically they're related, but they're not causally, uh, historically related. Um, there was a um, scholar named um, Isaac Kosovan, and uh, he was asked by the King of England to do, to do basically to write a critical history of of the Catholic Church because uh, England wanted to find um, a kind of midway point between you know the Protestants and and the Catholics and so they you know and both were heavily you know at war with each other and so he hired Casabon he was you know considered to be the smartest man at the time um, and um, to sort of do this. And so in the process of uh, going over some other texts, like kind of correcting some earlier texts and finding all the mistakes, he keeps coming across the references to Hermes, Tris Magistos, and he keeps coming across how, how old he is, and he's sort of the font of knowledge and, you know, the primal source and all that. And then when he actually looks at the texts themselves, because he's a Greek scholar and he's one of the few and he's a real, you know, um, precise humanist critical scholar. He says, well, this can't be the case because the Greek that these are written in, this is a much later Greek. This is a Greek that's later than Plato's Greek. Plato's Greek is a certain, what, whatever, I, I don't know the exact technical differences, but Plato's Greek is one way. And then this Greek is about 300, you know, 400 years later than Plato or, or whatever. And so it couldn't have been an even earlier, you know, kind of writing. So that sort of, and that was just like a byproduct. He, he, he didn't set out to do that. He just sort of his, his um, you know, fastidiousness, his meticulousness in, in doing his job led, it, led him to this. And it took a little while for the effects to, to um, uh, you know, for, for this to have its effect, but it did. It dislodged uh, Hermes from his position of prestige because suddenly he's considered, oh, well, he's, he's uh, a fake. Uh, he, he isn't, you know, from the dim primal time. He, uh, Moses didn't sit at his feet, and, and, and so, or Plato or, or anybody else. And then they try to explain, and um, Kosobun's, um explanation, which one was like picked up for a while, was that th these were written by some very zealous Christians who wanted to somehow show that um, this earlier Greek philosophy was really kind of a, a pre-echo or a presage of, of, of Christianity. And then that's why I say and there's, you can find references in the Corpus Hermeticum. Um, uh, you know, um, a man is called the son of man and, and things of like that, you know, things like that. So there's similarities and phrases that could, could be argued to say, oh, this is kind of pre-echo, just like John the Baptist, you know, came before Jesus, that sort of thing. And so they kind of made it a kind of pious lie. Um, and that, that was considered to be the case for a long time. But in, in more recent times, there, there's been some more generous um, interpretations of it and say, well, actually, no, the Egyptian stuff isn't just window dressing. Um, kind of like, you know, uh, just to make it interesting to people, they put all, a lot of Egyptian stuff and get them to read it. And then, you know, that's just, that's just something to uh, seduce you. So we actually know, there, there, you know, and there was this kind of Egyptian philosophy and, and so on and so on. So I think, although they certainly weren't written in the primal dawn, but... Um, that doesn't necessarily disqualify them from the prestigious position that they had held. Well, Gary Lachman, this has been a very informative uh, discussion and uh, about probably the, the central esoteric tradition in Western culture, uh, something that I think uh, all of our viewers will want to uh, be informed of, and I encourage them to uh, check out uh, your book on Hermes and your other books on uh, Western esotericism. Thank you so much for being with me. Well, as always, it's, it's an absolute pleasure uh, speaking to you, Jeffrey, and I look forward to doing it again next time. Likewise. Likewise.